Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us here on Pacific Partnerships for Education here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studio are Kara Miller from Kara Ocean Consulting. Welcome, Kara. And yeah. Kayla Ishida from the Coast Guard Academy. Excellent. You're the first Coast Guard Academy person we've probably had on this show. It's wonderful to have you both here. And our show is Who's Who in Guji Goo. <laughs> this is Kara's great title. Uh, for now, probably most people don't know. Where is Guji Goo? Good question. Good question. <laughs> Guji Goo is part of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. There's an atoll called Kwajalein Atoll. And we have a great image that shows Ebai Island, which is the biggest population hub in all of Kwajalein Atoll. About 12,000 people live there. It's also Animal the Zambar. most densely populated island on the planet. As you can see, there isn't a lot of open land left in that space right there. So if you see at the north end of Ebai, there's what looks like a sand road and a few small islands right past that road that are connected to Ebai. Gujigu Island is the third one past oh, Ebai. Okay. So actually, Kwajalein Atoll High School, I think I have an image that shows the high school as well, is located on Gujigu Island. Oh. And to accommodate students from many, many different schools, both mm -hmm. public and private, on Ebai, the camp itself was held at this place, uh -huh. at the high school okay. on Gujigu Island. Great, great. So, and this, this is a camp to help kids, introduce kids to the ocean and marine science. Uh, so, it, it seems sort of counterintuitive, right? People living on a small island, you would think they would all be intimately familiar with the ocean, would swim every day, would explore the ocean, but... But in fact, that's not the case. There hasn't been a lot of place-based, project-based, outdoor classroom-style education offered in the past to the mm -hmm. students in this place, especially around ocean and marine sciences. There is some environmental programs that are focused more on various gardens, learning gardens. I know your mm -hmm. clean water project mm -hmm. has a lot of field components to it, but not specifically about the ocean and marine science and coral reef and fisheries, both science and management side of all of that. So in the summer, when there isn't a lot going on for the kids on eBuy, mm -hmm. this summer camp concept was um, basically developed through the public school system mm -hmm. of, of the Marshall Islands. And being only the second year, it was the first time that the marine science and the ocean sciences were offered. A lot of the kids don't even swim regularly. Many do and love mm -hmm. the ocean, but quite a few don't and don't have a very high level of comfort uh, with the ocean at all. So using masks and snorkels and using data and gear that they're mm -hmm. collecting themselves to learn more about their marine environment, it was a first for that. Yeah, and yet that's really critical stuff, right? To, to take advantage of local resources, the local environment that the kids do know, they are familiar with it, they see it every day. It really helps, it shows them there's stuff to be learned from the world around them, right? They, they can draw some knowledge from, from their surrounding environment and uh, make sense of it and, and find that that too is science. It's not something done off in a laboratory somewhere, right? Yeah. So uh, take, take us through uh, a little bit about, about how you got this program going. Sure, yeah, my pleasure. You know, I have to give a lot of thank yous and gratitude to both the school system of the Marshall Islands, mm -hmm. specifically Jelton Anjane, who's the Associate Commissioner for Education for Kwajalein Atoll who I worked with in a past position that I held and mm -hmm. spent quite a bit of time over on eBuy throughout the year and then at times in the summer. And noticing that when school ends, there aren't a lot of summer school, continuing education, studying, preparation, whether it be for math, for science, for basic reading kinds of skills offered. Mm -hmm. And this is something that can both supplement what's already ongoing during the year and hopefully help with some of their performance on these tests and benchmarks, but also give them experiences and an opportunity to do something fun and exciting that's their home and their backyard that can show them a new possibility that makes education more relevant, more personal, more exciting, um, that there's a more emotional connection to. Absolutely. We've talked about before, I know, Ethan, you and I, about this connection to what you're studying right. and that really being the key right. to wanting to change something, whether yeah. it's in your behavior or 
your family's behavior or even larger on the whole island, what you see going on. And I think we really saw this program inspire them. Definitely. And I think what Kara was talking about, just like the opportunity to be able to go out and be in the ocean and look at what's around them. I think that was something that really inspired a lot of the students and just, you know, growing up on Kauai, being able to go out in the ocean every single day, that was something that I'm thankful for. And I think being able to share that experience with the students there was really something impactful and seeing that, you know, there's a possibility even for like the women that are there. So we worked with a lot of young girls there as well and just showing them that there's a lot of opportunities out there. It's just what you want from it. and allowing them to be out in the ocean and learn about what ecosystem is surrounding them. Yeah, I think it's very important for them to learn. They don't think of the ocean as being a classroom, right. but, but to learn that there is, there's things to be learned from this ocean. There, there are ways to study in the ocean and, and still have a, have a very good time, have a lot of fun, but mm -hmm. actually be learning things, being contributing also, contributing data to larger science databases, right? That's right. And also, why does it really even matter? And we talked a lot about the health component, human mm -hmm. health being very much linked to the health of the ocean. They all are very familiar with climate change. I think there's enough discussion and dialogue. They're hearing that term a lot, climate mm -hmm. change, and they're getting exposure to it. And, and yet they haven't quite made the connection that we were trying to help them establish regarding human health, mm -hmm. whether it's diet, whether it's feeling like you have some place to go that is quiet, that you can go to as a retreat place to mm -hmm. find peace mm -hmm. or find a deeper connection to your home or some place that basically is inspiring you to be more. So doing more from a leadership kind of mm -hmm. okay. discussion point for the island, mm -hmm. knowing that their ability to stay there as a community, as people, not just for the food from the fish in the ocean, but from, again, the, the health of that ecosystem being able to support, whether it's shoreline protection or a food source or recreation or all of these different ecosystem services that we've we, you know, coined that term here in the West. But I think that the, mar the marine science students had an opportunity that the rest of the campers didn't. So it was only about 40 out mm -hmm. of 103 students. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, from all different public and private schools and mm -hmm. the top five best students of each high school, but also the five, five at-risk students from mm -hmm. every high school, uh -huh. which we, I think we really appreciated getting to work with a spectrum of levels, of Absolutely. experience, of capabilities. And from the student that came off as distracted the whole time to the student that was the most engaged and excited, playing the leadership roles, they all gave us positive feedback about loving the content that they learned sure. and loving the experiences that they were able to have. Yeah, sure. so we feel such grateful a, for that. Such an enriching experience for these kids uh, because the school systems, particularly out in the region, don't tend to offer stuff like this. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's, so right. that's wonderful that you were able to do it. Yeah. So, so walk us through what sort of what process you took the kids through. Yeah, sure. You want to start? All right. So um, the Spartan camp was a larger aspect of it. So around 2 p.m., we took the kids, took them over to our marine science camp, and we kind of started off with a lecture. We would go through the today's objectives of what we're learning. So we talked about ridge to reef resource management, um, different species. We talked about pollution, you know, the ocean health related to human health, mm -hmm. just to name a few. And then we did the hands-on aspect of that. So actually going in the ocean doing some of the data collection and practicing those methods with them as well. Excellent. No, and it, it, it is critical that kids learn that, experience that, understand what a, a sh sort of a shrinking resource the ocean really is. Right. The, uh, uh, there's only, what I was reading recently, 13% of the ocean is considered wilderness. Now, I mean, the rest of it, the other 80-some right. percent is actually impacted by humans already. But that's astounding yeah. when you look at how much of the globe oh, is covered oh, by the health. ocean. When, yeah, when you sit so on little islands like these. That's right. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's truly amazing. So uh, why, don't, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the things that the kids were, were actually doing. Uh, the, the quadrants you were, you were teaching them to use to do surveys in a systematic way? Yes, quadrats. quadrats no N right. in there. That's okay. quite all right. This was a, a new word that okay. they all learned as well. and. From the program that I've talked about in the past on this show, Quest, it's mm -hmm. called Quantitative Underwater Ecological Survey Techniques. 
it is a University of Hawaii program mm -hmm. um, that's run out of various campuses throughout the Hawaiian Islands, and I've been fortunate enough to assist in the past. So that is where the concept for this field-based marine science camp came from. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of scuba dive-based, it's all snorkel-based. Mm -hmm. And one of the main methods that I wanted them to experience was building their own coral quadrats okay. and then using the coral quadrats to measure what percent of their marine environment is covered by coral instead of another substrate like sand or rock or algae. And then of that, how much of it is healthy? Okay. So I have a bunch of photos, I think, that show the process of using sure. PVC pipes, huge ones. They did all the sawing of the PVC pipes themselves. They put them together into our one by one meter quadrats and tied the string themselves. And again, this was something that they didn't quite understand what they were going to be doing mm -hmm. with these or why they were having to construct these. but. Once they were able to practice first on land, we did a lot of land-based practice first mm -hmm. before we ever went into the water, how to lay out a transect line, which is the line that you swim along to take your data samples or to do your data collections mm -hmm. or to basically collect your research data right. on. We use slippers, as you can see in this right. picture, to mo model the coral, but basically teaching them basic statistics, so basic mathematics, fractions, percentages, statistics, estimation, mm -hmm. and we had tied this into the larger scientific process as mm -hmm. well. So they were already uh, setting hypotheses based on basic observations that we did when we all went out as a group practicing snorkeling. That was mm -hmm. a skill they needed to just practice in themselves. So once we learned and felt more comfortable using the Quadrix on land, we did take them into the water. Um, we had three days that were really just focused on our field collection methods. We had two sites, and the kids were in teams, and they did all of this themselves. They, mm -hmm. they, they gear loaded up, you know, with a lot of gear. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the whole thing. You know, they have their, their transect line, their weights, their quadrat, their slates that they're writing everything down on. And, and then all, just helping each other out, you know, using the buddy system mm -hmm. kind of me mentality, making sure that everybody is together and safe. Mm -hmm. and, and we had some days where there was some current, a little bit of sidewash action, and our in and out was at a dock, but there were all kinds of hazards around still too. So I was really impressed, you know, the data collection aside, at just their ability to step up and handle all of this multitasking, for the first time ever, when they're still not even that comfortable snorkeling. Mm -hmm. Swimming is a different story, but snorkeling is actually a very specific skill in itself that they hadn't had a lot of practice with before right. I loaded them. We loaded them up with all this gear and sent them out to collect data. So. Excellent, excellent. So, um, and, and so, what uh, what sorts of things really briefly did they? What was sort of the big the big thing they found? through all this, really briefly. Sure, do you wanna talk about some of that? Yeah, I think above um, just the educational aspect, I think it's also just giving them the opportunity to learn. I think that is honestly the most impactful thing that they were able to take away from it because a lot of them, like we said, haven't even snorkeled before. They haven't even really looked at what, what, I ha what have I been missing out on my whole life of what's there. And I think sparking that interest in science and exploration and asking questions because once we did get out there you know a lot of them were going what is this what is this what why is it this way and mm -hmm. I think that's just really the big takeaway from it is opening up those doors and opening up those opportunities for those students. Wonderful. We're gonna explore this further when we come back right now I'm told we need to take a quick break. Uh, Kayla Sheeta, Kara Miller are with me here today. I'm Ethan Allen your host on Pacific Partnerships in Education and we'll be back in one minute.
When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Welcome back here to Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today in the studio are Kayla Ishida and Kara Miller. And we're talking about who's who in Gujigu. Uh, Gujigu being an, uh, an island in the, uh, on, off of Kwajalein Atoll, uh, actually Iba, I guess, in Kwajalein Atoll. Uh, and these marine science summer camps that uh, you had 40 high school students spent two weeks uh, learning about their local environment in terms of the, the underwater environment, really learning how to take data, what kind of data to do it, how to, how to do that systematically. Sounds like a very exciting uh, kind of situation for them. Uh, I'm sure you had planned all this whole workshop out very carefully, uh, but as so often happens, I suspect it probably didn't go exactly as you had planned, right? <laughs> Can you talk about some of the things that were maybe played out a little differently? Yeah, sure. You know, I was really, really impressed with the Spartan summer camp program overall. So one of the things that I wasn't anticipating was how busy these kids were. Every single day from morning to night, there was either class, regular three-period classes, math, reading, English, and then sports, traditional skills, Everything was based at the high school, so there was a lot of basketball and weaving, and they learned tennis, and there was actually two traditional Marshallese fisher, canoe builder, and weaver that came in from some of the outer islands to teach the kids more traditional methods of, yeah. of life, really. Right. And so there, there, were, there was not a lot of time. You mm -hmm. know, we had a, a more rigorous schedule planned with them. So right away, knowing we had less time. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was that I actually was anticipating just 11th and 12th graders, but we had as young as a seventh grader, some of the leader oh. eighth graders going into mm -hmm. eighth grade, all the way up to seniors. So we had the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned earlier, we had both the most competent in terms mm -hmm. of their test scoring and, and focus and things like that, and some of, and some of the others. So we really had a, a much wider variety of age group, experience levels, things, things like that. Um, and just how long some of these skills would take, I think we take them for granted now, mm -hmm. the snorkeling, for example. We take it for granted, but when you've never done it before, it is something that requires a lot of practice and mm -hmm. a lot of time and, and things like that. So, you know, we, we, we adjusted. Mm -hmm. we, we went with the flow. We, we adapted based on what we saw, the feedback that we got from the students very specifically. Those would be some of the main things. Sure, sure. And I know you, you did introduce them to these modern techniques, but also to some traditional techniques, like, like this traditional Marshallese fishing technique, right? Yeah, I was really excited. I had talked to Jelton about this, and I knew there was a canoe builder, one of the only ones left that knew all 146 parts of the canoe who was coming in to teach the kids about this, because no one on e -buy does this anymore, and definitely no one on e -bike does this traditional method of fishing. Mm -hmm. It was really, really neat. It was one of my favorite parts. So Joel Jake was his name. He came in from an outer island. He actually constructed a fishing net with the kids. Okay. It's yep, made it out of a very strong vine from mm -hmm. one tree and then palm leaves, as you can see, uh, stripped, prepared, and then in a very methodic way wrapped around the vines. And when this is done, it's a hun it's hundreds of meters long. Wow. It's incredibly long. And the kids actually got to go out, 
with Joel, with this line, they didn't go to as deep of a part of the ocean that traditionally it would be used in. It's mm -hmm. actually used to corral schools of tuna and other oh. highly migratory fish, if you can mm -hmm. believe that. Mm -hmm. And then actually swimming the thing, corralling the fish into the shallows, turns out they're scared of the palm fronds and they won't try to escape, even though in theory they easily could underneath the net. But I thought that was really amazing because mm -hmm. this was couched in the terms of marine science mm -hmm. and fisheries. And uh, we had talked to them about quantitative versus qualitative data. We had talked to them about Western science versus, again, a Western term, but versus mm -hmm. traditional ecological knowledge. Mm -hmm. And some of these more traditional forms of science that the West is just starting to really appreciate. I know you and I have talked about this before, but for them to get to learn from a master fisherman from their own place Amazing. and their own culture, but right. have it have it taught in the context of marine science and fisheries, right. I was really happy with how that turned oh, out. Yeah, rich, rich opportunities for discussion about why you know why why this is effective if the fish could swim out. Why don't they? Right. But what are the behavioral mechanisms that, that stop them from doing that? What? Why does no one do this anymore? Right. Right. Why have we never seen our family right. in Ebay using this net right. before? It just you just go pick a vine and yeah. pick some right. palms and Rather you know than buying a, a net, risking losing that net. That's and, right. The expense, the, the bring the plastic into the ocean, etc. Yeah, you don't don't want yeah. that. So no, wonderful, wonderful to be able to, to meld those two those two uh, aspects. Yeah, it was. And, and as you say, I mean, this is you're, you're really you're sort of on the forefront of this movement to try to engage uh, engage kids in this place based education that, that really is building their own capacities and building the capacities of the communities here to to really take charge of their future, which is so mm -hmm. important um, because these areas face a lot of a lot of challenges going forward, right? I mean, climate change, rising sea levels. Uh, Overcrowding in, in Ebi certainly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, water issues, this that. Uh, it's it's important for them to gain this kind of self-efficacy, right? Not to understand they can understand things, they can learn, they can learn new stuff, they can master new techniques. There's ways to combine their traditional knowledge uh, from their culture with other newly introduced techniques to them, and and mm -hmm. really hopefully build some good synergies there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think what you're talking about is empowerment and confidence mm -hmm. and I, I, yeah, self-efficacy, I heard you say, but you're right. It's, it's this idea of independence mm -hmm. and feeling like they can make it on their own. Mm -hmm. A lot of them feel like they want to stay in Ebi the rest of their lives, which is great if mm -hmm. that's what they end up doing, but we hope that the experiences they had in this camp will show them that there are other options. Right than to just work on the military base, or just be a mom, or a dad, or just take care of the house, that there are other options that in fact are desperately needed um, on this island. They're desperately yeah. needed, and um, I think that these kids realize they're capable of doing some of these things that are missing, these skills are missing. Yeah, so I was gonna ask, did you run into, this because your program here clearly uh, expands people's horizons in terms of the, the typical gender-specific roles they mm -hmm. are, uh, where women have very clear roles, men have very clear roles, and never the twain shall meet, right? Yeah, that's in the tradi yeah, traditional cultures. And did you run into resistance from the kids, or did they really just sort of go with the flow, as it were? I generally say that they went with the flow. I think some of the girls were a little bit more reluctant at first, and I think that's just part of the culture of, you know, the girls are kind of take a step back and let everyone else go first, but. I think those that were open to hear us and know what, that we're there to help them, I think they loved the program just as much as the male student ca counterparts. They were in the ocean, they were hanging out with Kara, hanging out on the side and be like, hey, what's, what's that? I'm so curious to see what's going on. And I think a little bit in the beginning, but honestly, overall, the girls were super interested and they loved the program. And That's I great. think it helps to promote their ideas and help promote their success in the future. Yeah, I, I think this is so important, again, to, to open people's eyes and expand their horizons, make them realize they do have choices. Yeah, if they want to stay on eBay and, and pursue a traditional fishing career, they've, they've gained a good deal of knowledge on how to do that, mm -hmm. right? If they want to think about going off to Stanford and becoming an electro, an electron mic microscopist, that, that door is now been cracked open to them, right? You know, that we they, did use a microscope. Okay. Yeah. We, were, we were able to use micro, uh, a single, <laughs> 
microscope with a power outage. <laughs> okay. Can you believe that? We just used our iPhone light. There Not we, we, but our helpers, our amazing helpers. Thank you, Sydney and Katie. <laughs> Good job. Um, we were really lucky to have a lot of support for this Excellent. program. Maybe I'll, I'll just mention that since I'm talking about it with okay. the Siderno family uh, ministry group that's out there, incredibly helpful for us helpful. during this program. Me feeling like Kayla's assistance and presence was invaluable. I couldn't have done any of this without her. Um, and it's a program that she's a part of that hopefully will keep repeating itself That's in right Dubai That's right about here. marine and environmental science. Wow, wonderful. I, I, I certainly hope that happens. Uh, it's, it's great. It's, you guys have started something big here. I, I think it's going to keep our fingers crossed. It's going to go places. It's going to become a regular part of that. And generations of kids will grow and have their lives enriched from it. Uh, Kayla Shida, Kara Miller, uh, have been here, uh, my, my wonderful guests here on Pacific Partnerships in Education, and I hope you'll come back in two weeks for our next show. Until then.